the ACC and FSU enter the discovery phase in Florida. Let's get into all 41 requests. Conference realignment and the FSU lawsuit are always in the news, so we're back on the big mountain to keep you updated. Hey, it's great to have you here on the mountain. I am JY, and this is my good friend Steve. We promised our viewers we were going to get into the discovery information on our last FSU update, and that is what we're going to do today. We're actually going to separate these. I want to focus only on the list of 41 items uh, that FSU has asked for in discovery, with the ACC, we'll do a separate uh, uh, episode later this week regarding the ACC's response to and their objections to all of these different items. It just was going to be way too much if we tried to do all, all of this in one episode. And really the detail here uh, is going to be in these 41 items. A, a lot of the objections that the uh, ACC kind of put forth is, is very repetitive. They kind of use the same types of things. I'll, I'll give a little bit of a, a teaser on that at the end of this episode, uh, but we'll get into more of that detail on, on a future episode later this week. So let's get into it, Steve. Um, as we discussed on our last episode, both parties agreed to a stay of discovery in North Carolina um, until after the hearing for the motion to dismissal or stay was heard. And that hearing is this Friday, March 22nd. We're actually here uh, already. And uh, we'll see how that goes here at the end, of the, the end of the week. That did not happen in Florida. So there was not, this, not a joint agreement to do this in Florida. So we move forward with this hearing. Um, and we're going to move forward with discovery. So FSU made its first request of discovery in Florida. And the ACC uh, was required to then meet a deadline to file their objections. And they did that last Monday, as we talked about. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I don't want to get into the objections yet. Let's focus on these 41 requests. Um, and so we're, we're going to get right into them. I'm going to list all 41 of them. I'm going to kind of break them down into chunks. We can have a discussion after, after each group. The first group here that we're really going to get into uh, is around ESPN and some documents with the, the media rights agreements. They get into some more media rights stuff later on. But they start off here with just a few items and then they get right into ESPN. So item number one, they ask for all documents and communications with the Florida Attorney General related to her public records request dated January 4th, 2024. We did an episode on that request. It's been silent since then. You know, she did publicly put that request out and we really haven't heard anything uh, about that request. So item number one is FSU saying, answer her request, basically. And, item, and they want a copy. Not, don't just give it to the Attorney her, General, but right. we want to see we want what everything. And, and you're going to hear me say everything starts with, or almost everything starts with, all documents and communications about X, Y, and Z. So they don't just want the document that maybe is being sent to the mm -hmm. Attorney General. They want all emails and correspondence mm -hmm. within the ACC about what they're going to do and what they're going to send and all the back and forth about that. And that's for everything here. So I'll, I'll try to not say all documents and communications 41 times, but it is in just about every one of their, their requests here. So item number two is the ACC's operating budgets from 2010 until the present. One would think all members would have those, but you know, okay, they're asking for that. Now we get into the ESPN stuff. All documents and communications related to the negotiation and execution of the following ESPN agreements. One, the multimedia agreement dated July 8th, 2010. Two, the amendment and extension of that agreement from May 9th, 2012. Item three, the second amendment to the multimedia agreement dated June 24th, 2014. Number four, the amended and restated multimedia agreement dated July 21st, 2016. Item number five, the network agreement dated July 21st, 2016. That network agreement really was the beginning of the ACC Prestige Network. It took them a while to get there, but that's what that what they're talking about there. And then the last item, the letter amendment dated uh, August 21st, 2021, and all other documents and communications related to the decision by the ACC to extend the unilateral nine-year option for ESPN. 
Remember, ESPN has gotten involved in these agreements, at least in, in North Carolina, and they are requesting that some of these documents, probably all of these multimedia agreements, be sealed. Uh, and we'll see where that goes here because they have taken a side. We asked originally, what kind of side are they going to take? Uh, clearly, they were going to say yes, seal, or no, don't seal. We did an episode that they did much more than just say yes, seal. They actually went on the attack to, to FSU. So I'm going to stop there, Steve. And that, that was kind of it. I mean, really, it's those first six items really is just the media agreements and, and subsequent amendments. That's really item number one. Item number two is that network agreement. And then item number three is this unilateral option that the commissioner gave to ESPN to allow them two more years to decide if they want to extend this agreement. So anything on those items? Well, first of all, I would say there's really no surprises in this section. Um, very standard, obvious things to ask yes. for. Um, now, you know, JY, and, and anyone who's been watching these, I've always expected from the very beginning for ESPN, Disney to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. And at some point for this to become a kind of a state of Florida, ver, you know, versus ESPN, Disney, we've, we, we've talked about, the, you know, their, their request to keep things sealed. Right. Um, as kind of maybe a first step into that. And, and I think, you know, a lot of these documents are just kind of furthering that process. I don't know if it will get to that point for right. sure. I still expect it to eventually unless they settle before it gets to that point. Yeah. But very just obvious, uh, uh, no surprise items are requesting here. Everything makes a lot of sense. I think it's going to, with the, with, in, in the things that they're requesting really play into um, the, the case that Florida State is trying to make right. against the ACC, trying to say basically, one, that they didn't represent their members properly, they didn't uphold their fiduciary responsibilities, which the ACC doesn't even acknowledge that they have any fiduciary responsibilities to right. their members, but the, but the ACC is alleging that they have it, and also the possibility of fraud. Right. Um, so where maybe that the, the ACC was not representing things correctly and truthfully to their members mm -hmm. as far as those negotiations between the conference and ESPN. Um, so, I again, none of this is surprising, I, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities here for kind of just traps, information to come out. You know, if there's one communication, cause like you specifically mentioned, it's not just the document. We want the back and forth, the right. emails, yep. uh, all of that. Uh, so if there's anything in there that they find which is contradictory to what ESPN was telling their members, boom, right away, they've got something to work with. They've got something to grasp on. So I think there's a lot of opportunities in there. And and I, to me, there's no way that ESPN and the ACC are going to be successful in keeping these documents sealed. Yeah. They are obviously part of the case. Um, they are, they are, it's important material. Um, so no surprises, but I think a lot of opportunities in there. Um, to just to, to basically crack this case open or just to find some kind of nugget they can use and yeah. wiggle around a little bit. Well, and the agreements are going to be important, obviously, but the communications mm -hmm. here, I think, are even more important. Yes. What really was happening behind the scenes? Absolutely. With, and you know, we're just getting started. I'm only yeah. on item three of, yes. four, of 41 right now. But the, the communication piece to this, and we're going to get into a lot more stuff regarding fiduciary duty, backdoor dealings, all that kind of stuff that, that they've already discussed. We'll get into some of that here in a minute. Um, but it's interesting because you've, you've pointed out before this whole Florida versus Disney type yep. of situation. Item number one, they bring up the Florida AG. Yep. Item number three already, they're bringing up ESPN. So it's right at the beginning of this request. And I'm sure the Florida State lawyers, their, their attorneys they've hired, uh, the university's hired, yep. I, I'm sure they would love for this to turn into a Ron DeSantis and yep. a Florida AG battling it out with Disney. Um, they would love for that to happen. We'll see if it if it does get to that point, but this opens the door. So let's get into the next piece. It's really going to be around the Constitution of the ACC and the grant of right documents. So item number four they're requesting here is the documents and communications related to the September 13th, 2011 amendment to the ACC Constitution. This amendment uh, added some of the withdrawal provisions that we've talked about before. Item number five, all documents and communications related to the September 2012 amendment to the ACC Constitution. This was the increase of the withdrawal penalty, what they now call, I think, that, that severe withdrawal penalty, the three times the operating budget. We've talked about that a lot and whether that's liquidated damages or what exactly is that, but they get into that. Item number six, all documents and communications related to ACC's efforts to determine the enterprise cost of 
a member to withdrawal. Again, trying to figure out what is the actual value of that. Uh, item number seven, the March 2013 competitive marketing analysis presented by the ACC's media consultant and all documents related to it, as well as the terms and conditions of the ESPN SEC network agreement. We talked about that competitive market analysis on prior episodes. I'm not surprised that they're, they're looking for a lot of information and communication about that because that drove the agreement with ESPN. And, you know, hindsight now is them saying, well, that, that analysis was clearly flawed because we can point to these other uh, entities that have gotten much greater deals than we had. What were you looking at in this analysis? So that's what, that's what they're asking for. Item number eight, all documents and communications related to the 2013 grant of rights. Again, maybe not so much document, but certainly the communications piece to that. And then, of course, item number nine, documents and communications related to the 2016 amendment to the grant of rights. Remember, the grant of rights document was actually put in the filing of the ACC originally. Um, and so it's going to be interesting what else comes out of that. Not just that three page or four page document. How much support are they going to get to that document as well? Uh, two more things, and I'll throw it to you. All documents and communications regarding the ESPN ultimate or ultimatum described in the complaint. That's, again, back to your point that you talked about. That's where supposedly ESPN gave the ACC this ultimatum of, you better do this or we're, we're kind of out. Um, and that's what they communicated to their members. So uh, some of these different things are going to be tied back and forth. Uh, but that's what that one's for. And then the last one here, just the documents and communications from January 1st, 2015 to the present related to the ACC bylaws 2.10.3. And I'll let you know what that is. This is the conference media rights agreements. And in the bylaws, it states, I, pu I pulled it up just to give some, some information here. Um, this is the section that gives the commissioner the right to negotiate all media rights contracts and agreements for the conference. So again, they're asking for the documents and communication. How did that all come about back in 2015? So we'll stop there. The next piece we're going to get into, Steve, is the wonderful... Raycon and Swolfer Ooh, pieces, so salacious. Uh, we're getting this, uh, the, the, right. the, 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 dirt, the dirty here uh, after this. Piece. So what, what are you thinking about the grant of rights in the Constitution? Okay, stuff? so for this section, um, so first of all, you mentioned about the grant of rights and yeah. that they want a copy of it and yeah. that it was already in the ACC filing previously. Yes. Now, when I read this, it's been two or three days since I went through and read all this, yeah. but I seem to remember, I think it was the grant of rights, where they were specifically asking for the executed version. Right. Which to me means they don't want just a draft copy. They want to see who are the signatories on this, what are the dates, were there any notes, were there any footnotes, the actual version the, the, the executed version, this is what we're going on. Well, the signature pages were a part of the ACC's filing. So, uh, again, uh, they, they clearly know there's more to it than right. what they received and in in what the ACC gave. So it's everything else that wasn't yes. already obviously made yeah. public is what they're trying to get at. There's here. something they're looking there's for something there. There's something there, absolutely. They specifically are asking for the executed version. You now, got it. That leads, so with this section again, I, I don't want to repeat myself too much from the first section other than to say, all of these make sense. I don't think there's a lot of surprises here. Right. Um, you know, this is just normal stuff. And again, it's opportunities for them to find something in that mm -hmm. communication back and forth yep. that proves their case of, you know, lack of fiduciary responsibility, um, you know, basically coercion, um, possibly fraud, mm -hmm. or, you know, or just acting uh, improperly. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities. Now, I do want to talk about, you mentioned in the first section about, the opera yearly operational budgets yes. and we talked about some other documents in here so again i want to go back to that um you know the acc has had this strategy for a long time mm -hmm. of keeping a lot of these documents under lock and key uh to shield them from state sunshine laws right. okay which on its face value you know sounds like something smart to do because all these states they have their different sunshine laws so we want to shield um but at the same time, I think they almost set a trap for themselves a long time ago when they decided, decided to do this. Yeah. Because, again, it just kind of shows, okay, why don't the members have copies of their operational budgets? Right. Why don't why don't they have copies of uh, contracts that are they're signed by them that have been executed? Um, it just, 
you know, it just kind of leads to just a, uh, you know, the perception of, hey, we're trying to do something underhanded. I think it just solidifies Florida State's case. It's just another kind of brick in the wall of Florida State's case of, hey, we've never even been able to have access to this. We want to, and then when they do get access, if they can find anything, even just a couple little things here and there that don't line up with what the ACC was telling Florida State or its members, uh, it just gives them a lot of opportunities where if they would have had these documents all the time and had access to mm-hmm. them, it, you know, okay, there's not as many surprises. So anyways, um, th- that was my main point is there's a lot of documents here. They were shielded. I think it was, I understand the legal strategy from the beginning. Let's keep it. So all these state agencies, taxpayers, and and every Yahoo, uh, you know, in the neighborhood can't go and request these documents. But I think that they kind of opened themselves up to some danger in a, in a lawsuit like this. Well, I will say, let me jump. Let me jump ahead one because okay. this was an opinion I wanted to give uh, at at the end. But I'm gonna. You brought it up, and I want to give it okay. now. So, uh, item two was the budgets. Item forty one is all of AC all the ACC's tax returns from twenty ten to present. Okay, they're a non profit entity. They would have a, a form nine ninety right. is what they would be submitting at least to the federal government. I'm not sure what the the state of North Carolina would would have them do. Um, but th- those are all public documents. Right. So. I don't I don't quite understand and I'm going to use these two specifically the operating budget mm-hmm. and the tax returns. Mm-hmm. 99.99% the members have those. The members approve the operating budget. So they would have that. So I don't quite understand why and th- and these are two that aren't talking about documents and communications right. they're literally they asking the for we want the operating budget and we want the tax returns and i will tell you again i, I said we tease a little bit of what the acc's responding with i can tell you on item 41 their response was they're public documents yeah. they're out there you can get them whenever you want them i, I would assume i didn't look at number two for the uh, operating budget that's going to be the same type of deal you guys approve the budgets you should already have these so i i do i don't quite understand i get what you're saying that maybe there's something there that they're trying to find and that's why we have discovery you're trying to find yep. things yep. but i would also say the operating budget and the tax returns uh, if there is something there, oh, ACC is in deep, deep trouble. I wouldn't think there is because these are public documents anyway, but I don't want to go off too much on a tangent on that because there's more salacious stuff we got to get to. Well, I'll just say to that, obviously the tax return, those are public documents like yeah. we mentioned. We don't know, how, as far as operating budgets, we don't know how they were operating. Sure. It could have been, you've probably sat in a few budget meetings in your life. Yes, uh, I have. It could have been something where they're giving a PowerPoint presentation that's an overview of the budget. Sure. And not approving the actual line by line looking at all the accounting codes and how all the dollars you know so we'll see it's and those are a couple documents obviously they're asking for a whole bunch of stuff right yeah so let's get into the raycom and swoford uh information boy so uh we got about let's see we got about 10 items here that i'm going to go over and then i'll throw it to you so item number one well this would be item number 12 in terms of their entire list all documents and communications related to the raycom sports partnership Item 13, all documents and communications related to any determination or failure to make a, any determination by the ACC as to whether John Swoford had a conflict of interest with respect to the Raycom Sports Partnership. Item 14, documents and communication related to Raycom on the one hand, Raycom on the one hand, and Swoford and any relative by blood or marriage to Swoford, and they name Chad Swoford, Nora Williams Swoford, and Caitlin Swoford on the other hand. Again, really going hard at this um, kind of uh, backdoor dealings, Mm -hmm. self-dealings, going hard at it here. Item 15, documents and communications related to the negotiation and execution of the following RACOM agreements. Number one, the Digital Rights Management Agreement, dated July 2010. And number two, the amendment to that agreement in November of 19. Item number 16, all documents and communications relating to any payment of money or other consideration made to Raycom since 2010. Number 17, all documents and communications relating to the amount of money and other consideration Raycom has earned off the media rights of the ACC since January 1st, 2010. Item 18, any communications between John Swoford and Raycom relating to in any way 
the media rights of the ACC members since January of 2008. Number 19, all docs and communications between Swoford and John Skipper of ESPN from January 1st, 08 to December 31st, 21. Again, docs and communications between Swoford the Commissioner and Skipper of ESPN. Item 20, all docs and communications related to Raycom or Boston College between John Swoford on one hand and his son Chad Swoford or Caitlin Swoford on the other hand from January 1st, 2004 to the present. And then the last one, Steve, all disclosures by John Swoford to the ACC or the ACC members regarding his conflicts of interest. So I know the one headline that I saw when this first came out was they're naming the whole family. Here's who they're named. I mean, originally we knew John, we knew Chad. Mm -hmm. They add more names to it yep. here. They are they are going hard at it. So what are your thoughts? So, okay. Again, no surprises here. Yep. All of this makes sense. I have no earthly idea if the Swofords are total crooks right. <laughs> or, uh, that, that were just lying in their pockets, stealing money, which I think a lot of our, our FSU viewers yes. basically have just concluded. Then yes. they might be. Or... If they're just that, you know, hey, they're a good family looking out for, you know, these universities and the ACC and whatever. Um, but what I do know, okay, you and I both work in a in a in a, a sector in an industry where yep. we don't hire our kids, right? We don't hire right. our spouses yep. or whatever for this reason, yes. for just even the appearance of um, self dealing or impropriety. Mm -hmm. um, there's reasons we don't do that, and I mean, this is I mean, this is nepotism. This is incestuous business practices mm -hmm. at least that that's what it looks like it could be and Correct. they're trying to get some more documents to show that mm -hmm. and again this is just another opportunity you know florida state what's what are they alleging that the acc wasn't looking out for its members they were looking out for themselves and lining their own pockets they potentially committed fraud or at worst at worst they committed fraud and at best they were self-dealing right. and not looking out for their members so again these are just more opportunities. If there is anything in the, any of these communications, so some of the people, you know, we've got sons, we've got we got daughter-in-laws, we've got, you know, whatever. Um, if there's anything in there that looks like the ACC or a, a, a uh, officer of the ACC is trying to put money in his own pocket or his kids' pockets, um, instead of getting the best possible deal for the members and making the most money for the members of the ACC, you know that's a, that's a that's a smoking gun. That's a that's a bullet in their arsenal that they can use to prove. And and again, all of these are opportunities. Yeah, they can find. They, it doesn't actually have to be a smoking gun. They can yeah. find small things here, small things there to support their overall claim that the ACC was self dealing, was not looking out for their interests. And you know, if they do that, it's game over. Um, you know, not only I personally think again this was gonna is gonna end in a settlement where Florida State has to pay something. Yeah. But it, with with Florida State getting all of this discovery, and if they can just find a few things, we we could get into a position if this plays out all the way where they could blow the ACC up, walk away without having to pay a penny, and maybe the ACC doesn't exist anymore. I think there's a lot of danger. I don't know if any of that's going to happen. Right. Um. That, but that is a possible end game with all of the things that they're requesting. Well, at, at this point, given the pushback uh, from the ACC so far, uh, I don't view them as being very frightened by or intimidated by any of the stuff FSU has put forth. I know that a lot of the headlines uh, are, again, very salacious. They like to bring this stuff up. But I'm not seeing anything, at least from the side of the ACC yet, that's, that leads me to believe that they are feeling endangered by much of this. Now, that can change, and they, it could be their front right now. But I want to go back to number 21, and okay. I'm going to take the I'm going to I'm going to take the other side of okay. this, will not which will not probably uh, appease the FSU people right. that, that may be listening to this. But I just want to I want to bring the other side in here. So, item 21 was disclosures by John mm -hmm. whether or not he had any conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. So, how do we know? If this wasn't already brought up back in 2004 and 2010 and and the members were very much aware there is documentation regarding his possible conflict of interest that's yeah. and then and then that's broad 
Um, and if the members were made aware of that and they were okay with it at that time, there could be documents that, that say that. We don't we don't know that. So it's easy to the jump jump to, and I don't know this guy. You, you, you said yeah, it in the we beginning. Don't know if well, I don't know who this might dude be is. People. He could be a freaking crook. Or I have total no, crook, yeah. yeah, I couldn't tell you about yeah. him. But, I, you know, we like to have discussion here. Mm -hmm. We don't like to be focused on just one narrative. Let's look at the other narrative. And mm -hmm. this is a great item for discovery yep. because it could bring out information that actually supports the ACC side of things, potentially could. in terms of a conflict of interest. We don't know yet. We have right. no idea. Uh, but, but you know, we'll get there. You're well, I, I, wanna, I do want to make okay. one other point. I, I totally understand what you're saying as far as the ACC not looking scared. Mm -hmm. But as we saw in the pack. Both sides want to look as strong as possible at sure. the beginning. And then if you see one side lose a ruling or two, all of a sudden we, we're motivated to settle. And we're we're coming up on some big uh, rulings we like we talked about. You know, the, the jurisdiction, yeah. all of that stuff. So we'll see after a couple rulings, one side or the other might start to be scared. Yes. And if, if it goes, you know, the ACC's way, Florida State might all of a sudden look scared and be sure. like, okay, how much do we have to pay to get out of here? Because obviously this isn't going our favor. And we've said it over and over again. The venue and jurisdiction yeah. are our top two items. We're going to get an answer to one of them, I, I think, maybe on Friday. There's at least a hearing. I, I assume the judge will probably rule. I don't know if he'll rule that day or not. But, um, you know, we're going to get close at least to the NC side of things. And you're right. That could significantly shift. Uh, in terms of how, how the ACC, I think especially the ACC, feels they're in control of this or maybe losing control of this. But let's get on to the next item here. We're on item number 22. We're getting into more of the media rights. I know we talked about ESPN early on, but we're going to get back to some of the media rights, their competitiveness, and the prestige networks for both the ACC and some other um uh, entities here as well, other conferences. So item number 22, uh, docs and communications concerning the competitiveness of the ACC's current media rights arrangements and any comparison to those media right agreements with the Big Ten, the SEC, or the Big 12. Of course, they are deeming themselves one of the P4, so they want to be compared to the three other P4 members right now. Item 23, all docs and communication concerning the competitiveness of the ACC network and compar comparisons to the prestige networks, again, of the Big 12, the Big 10, and the SEC. All docs and comms related to any sublicensing agreement with Raycom or any other third party. Number 25, all docs and communications related to any payments or other consideration in cash or in kind made by Raycom Fox, Bailey, or the CW network, or any other third party for the rights to uh, or for related ACC games and content. And then item 26, all documents and communications related to the licensing, sub-licensing, offering, or granting of the broadcast, digital, media, or other rights to and related to ACC games and other assets. So that kind of ends that section, really focusing, I think, on the narrative of one of many that the deal that we got is not compared, com it's not comparative and not fair compared to the other three power uh, prestige networks. I mean, that's what they're asking for here. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's probably a little harder um for them to that's one of their harder arguments to make yeah. i think i mean obviously the acc is getting less money yes but is that because they're just their product isn't as good or is it right. because the acc the 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 um officers the the board or you know whoever the acc yeah. as they were acting is it because they didn't fairly represent and and fight for their members right were they lying to their members they're looking for anything in there that's um you know misleading or or whatever, but I think that's going to be a little bit of a harder yeah. pull, but we'll, let's see what they can pull out of the documents. Yep. So communication, we're getting close to the end here. Next piece chunk that they have here is on communication. So number 27, documents and communication with any ACC member since December 20th, 2023 related to this lawsuit. Item 28, any document of communication with the uh, any ACC member related to the ACC's lawsuit with the Board of Trustees of FSU. Item 29, all documents communications about FSU or the FSU Board of Trustees or any of their personnel. Item 30, all documents and communications identified in, referenced in, utilized in, formulating or related to the ACC amended complaint. 
Item 31, all documents and communications regarding the ACC and ESPN concerning the grant of rights and the amended grant of rights. Item 32, documents and communications related to the conference realignment that has occurred in the 2020s, including without limitation to anything. Item 33, all documents and communication related to any uh, invitation or overture to add members to the ACC since January 1st of 2020, including Cal, Stanford, and SMU. So uh, a lot here. I mean, I can only imagine those, those seven items that I just went over, the amount of emails that they're going to have and different communication about all of this. Holy cow, just those seven alone. I mean, that's going to be a ton of paper that they're, they're going to have to sift through there steve what you thinking i mean my first thought is you know every everybody who's whether you're a private individual you're a corporation you're a huge nonprofit organization right. whatever you wanted to avoid discovery because yep. of requests like this yep. all of these emails yep. i mean there are so many opportunities for one wrong thing to yeah. be in an email even it could be sent as a joke, joke. uh i saw you know i was watching a a documentary on the Duke case mm. um, and, and, you know, the, the terrible injustice that, that happened there. Right. Um, and one of the main things that, that kind of came out during that case, and it was leaked to the public, was an email where a student said a joke and it was used as, you know, obvious evidence of something. Sure. So there's so much risk, when, you know, when you're requesting all these documents and you're yeah. putting them out into the, into the light to find something. I will say we talked about some documents and why they would be requesting these to be put in discovery. Mm -hmm. Again, neither of us are lawyers, so sure. we, we 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 haven't gone to law school and we're not uh, we're not you know experts on the specific um, strategies of lawyers when yeah. they're when they're doing a case like this. Uh, however, I will say I, I there there is a, sometimes there is a a good reason to get something put into into evidence yeah. or put into the court record and maybe they already have a document and maybe there's a reason they can't just put that document but if they ask for it on discovery right. now it's part of the court records right. now it's potentially public if the judge isn't sealing these documents mm -hmm. Um, so they may, some of these things that they may already have and other documents we talked about, they may have a specific reason why maybe they're prohibited from just publishing it on their website, mm -hmm. but if they can get it into the, the public record of this case, um, you know, th they may have some benefit to that. So I'll just throw that out there. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yep. Uh, certainly a rhyme or reason to everything that they're asking for. Um, so let's get into the next two, the CFP. Of course, that, that was a hot item that that they even started out with in their litigation. I mean, that, that was one of the first, in the fair first paragraph. So two items here, item 34, docs and communication related to the decision by the CFP committee to treat SMU as less than a whole participant. And then number 35, all docs and communications related to the decision by the CFP committee to exclude FSU from the 23-24 college football championship series so you know the claim all so far has been especially from the fans the acc did nothing for us they weren't here to back us up they weren't public enough about it they weren't trying to push us to get in that they they really did nothing and this is asking for did did you do anything what communications did you have i mean that's what these two are asking for yeah, and uh, again, these make sense. I, I don't think there's a real surprise here. I, I still, I do think there's an opportunity here. Um, you know, the, the okay. So the college football playoff, they've had this continuous contract with ESPN. The ACC has had this continuous contract with ESPN. Mm -hmm. Florida State gets left out of the college football playoff. I personally think I'm not usually a big conspiracy theory believer. Yeah. And so I think they were just left out because their quarterback got hurt and it sucked. You know, it was bad timing for them, kind of a crappy thing. But if they can kind of push this narrative that, again, ESPN, the college football playoff committee, and even the ACC are not working in the best interests of their members, in this case, Florida State, that's just another part. If they can show some other parts yep. and they can show this uh, and show just a lack of fighting, uh, it's just another brick in that wall that they're, uh, of a case that they're building against the ACC. Certainly, and, and these aren't standalone items, right? right? Like, there could be five of these items that are in different portions of this yep. request that they're going to be using to build this one 
one of several, obviously, mm -hmm. but large pieces that they're really going to push forward in this case. Uh, and they're going to get it from different areas. They're yeah. going to get it about from the CFP committee. They're going to get it from, you know, these other uh, communications with other members. They're going to get it from XYZ. So, yeah, good and, point. And they can always ask. Discovery is not a one-time opportunity. Right. They can always ask for more documents. So if there's something that they see in these communications with the playoff committee or whatever, they can ask for more documents and, and use that as, okay, well, they're referencing this conversation. Mm -hmm. Now we want the, the records of the, of maybe ESPN and the committee yep. um, and, and what, what they talked about. So the, a lot of these items can, can lead to more uh, discovery requests later on. Absolutely. Yep. So let's get to the last couple here. The mainly document, just some other stuff. So 36 is any antitrust analysis of either the grant of rights or the ACC's withdrawal penalties. We've talked about that in, in previous episodes. Item 37, all docs and anything related to the response to the plaintiff's list of first interrogates. Item 38, all docs intended to offer into evidence at any hearing or trial related to this matter and any items that may be potentially or that may potentially be offered. Item 39, all docs utilized in formulating or related to the assessment of damages. And item 40, all emails, texts, messaging, and social media communications related to this lawsuit. So the, the last couple here, you know, 37, 38, 39, catch I would all. guess catch all. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm sure this is at the end of a lot of discovery. I don't read many discovery <laughs> motions. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's probably kind of, uh, you know, kind Part of like the course, all standard, other right? items yeah. type of thing, right? So that's it. We got through it. Um, any final things? I, I do want to tease a little bit about what ESPN, I think, is going to be putting in some of their uh, objections to some of these items. So, got through all of this. What are your final thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, just I'll just wrap up by saying, I mean, obviously, th this whole episode, it's about discovery requests from Florida State. So, you know, as we're looking at this, it's going to come from the perspective of Florida State. Yes. Um, but I will say, on the whole, none of it is surprising. And I think, but it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a huge request that just, you know, when they get all these documents, if they get all these documents, uh, just is going to lay out a whole bunch of opportunities. They're going to have a lot of paths. Um, you know, when you talk about, like, paths to get to the playoffs or paths to win, you know, a conference or whatever, you talk about all the different ways, they're giving themselves as many opportunities as possible yep. and, and pathways to get to where they want, which is to get out of the ACC, which is going to happen, at the lowest price possible, whether yes. that's zero or half a billion dollars, mm -hmm. we'll find out. But I think this request just gives them a lot of paths to get to where they want to go. Agree with you. And, you know, a lot of what you're hearing here in, in Discovery are items that obviously we've talked about and that have been in their litigation, uh, in, in their legal documents, their lawsuit from the very beginning. Yep. Um, but it, it is interesting, I think, some of this, especially when you get the, the Swoford uh, yeah. information, what specifically they're asking for, that's going all the way back to Boston College. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting to, to hear. Again, no real surprises that I found in this, to be honest with you, um, but just some interesting stuff. I have one last thought on this: the Sw Swoford, Swarford, I, Swafford, yeah, Swoford, Swoford, yeah. whatever. I think it's Swaf. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> my, my last thought on that is: I think a lot of our Florida State viewers, um, you know, they they that's the like the area they gravitate to. Yeah. It's the sensational thing. It gets the headline, and there are definitely some opportunities in there if they can show some kind of self dealing, yeah. some kind of fraud. That's a that's huge. Okay. But what I'll say is don't uh, psychologically put all your eggs in that basket because it may turn out to be an absolute nothing burger. But there are, even if that happens, there's a lot of other avenues for Florida State to prove, um, you know, the things that they're trying to to prove. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that section as kind of like a, a it could be a high reward or it could be nothing. Uh, and and don't, don't, don't get caught up in that too much just because it's the fanciest, it's the sexiest, it's the headline-grabbing item. And really, is, is that more against him and potentially his family, but him? Or is that really against the ACC as a whole? If he did things behind everybody's back, the members and everyone, and it wasn't this whole, uh, you know, uh, collusion within the, within the ACC at, the, at that level – and it was just on him, then, okay, the, you know, your your spear should be pointed directly at that guy, which is what they're doing, but I don't think you can necessarily hold the entire ACC accountable, but he is the commissioner as well. Yeah, he was so he's signing, you know, yeah. so I don't know exactly how, you know, that personal uh, litigation, if you will, that, that personal piece comes into the whole 
um, conference side of things. So we'll see how it plays out. I said I tease a little bit of, of what you're going to hear from ESPN's objections. So I'm not going to give you a lot, but I'm going to give you a couple things. These are not new. You've heard everything I'm going to say before. But of course, number one, they're going to talk about trade secrets, especially with you know the, the actual agreements with ESPN. They are going to hang their hat on trade secrets until they can't any longer. Uh, so you're going to hear that a lot. And also just disclosure of privileged or non-privileged information. They're going to hang their hat a lot on that as well. And then specific to the Swofford issue, you're going to hear a lot about statute of limitations. And has some of this, both in Florida and North Carolina, it's too late really to have anything done about it. However, we'll, I'll get back to the previous point where, okay, they can't do anything about that data now, but it serves their, their purpose of giving this broad, broad brush um, information about how the ACC has been dealing things for decades. Right, so we'll see what happens there. I got a, I have a, a, an addition to your tease. Okay, um, something that you know maybe our viewers can look up. Uh, from what I understand, fraud negates statute of limitations. Yes, that's so my understanding. That's something we'll have to explore a little deeper. That's my understanding. Good point. So anyway, hey, that was a lot. If you made it to the end, we really appreciate it. Like I said, we're going to do another episode towards the end of the week, specific to the objections. I won't be as long as this because they're, we're going to keep it more kind of clumped around what their, their high-level objections are. Uh, but we got through the discovery, and things are just moving forward. I am anxious for the hearing in North Carolina on Friday the 22nd. That's going to give us an idea about venue and jurisdiction. Could really move the ball forward or backward for these two parties, depending on what, we, what the uh, judge rules in that case there. So, hey, with that, we thank you guys for watching. Make sure you give this one a like. Subscribe if you like our content. We are going to stay on this case until the very, very end. And just as a reminder, we do live episodes on Wednesday evenings, 8.30 Eastern. We're going to do another one here just in a few days. So if you want to come on, say hello to us, ask us a few questions, we'd love to hear from you. We're going to focus those on the Mountain West and the Big Ten. But I know we had some FSU people on and we got into some of that here this last week. We're happy to do it again. So with that, hey, we thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time on the Big Mountain.